Well, what's up, nerds? Welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 6. We have dispensed with the lunch break, and we're back ready to get into the thick of it. Just five round separators from our top eight, and we're going to guide you through the next couple of them. My name's Ronnie Knight, joined by Eduardo Sadgalic, and it's our great pleasure to bring you live coverage of this standard format. Down in the feature match area, we had a quick look at the leaderboard from Maria at the desk, and you're going to see some of those players right now live, large and in charge on your screens. We're going to kick things off with Ely Cassis and Gregor Kowalski. Now, both of these players will be well known to many uh, rusted on Magic viewers. Ely, a fan favorite. He's on Golgari Adventures. Gregor Kowalski, however, in the MPL, he's uh, on a very, very different deck. One we haven't seen too much of this weekend. Yeah, playing Jeskai, Fi Jeskai Fires uh, with the Fae of Wishes mm. sideboard package, able to take some extremely powerful cards, kind of across all colors of magic. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it usually magic. gets casualties, casualties of war, which is playing no Jeskai colors. Right, exactly. Finally, all five colors together at last. At last. As, as, as the prophets foretold, my friends, both players kicking things off with temples here. Now, Cassis is playing another deck that I'm a huge fan of, Golgari Adventures. I've been playing it myself for a long time. I was playing a, sl a much faster version that the curve topped out at three with Murderous Rider. This one going much bigger. We talked about this yesterday. It's got Liliana. It's got a Rankle uh, Master of Prankles. It's got Vraska Golgari Queen. Much more of a mid-range bent to this Golgari Adventures deck. And, and the, the reason for that is because of all these Oko food decks. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to keep toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, get that card advantage, because the Oko decks are generally engineered to beat the aggro decks kind of clean, unless you, they have Ember Cleave. Game one should favor Kowalski heavily. Really? Is that right? Right. The reason for that is uh, one player can interact with the other. Oh, I see and what's it's happening not, And it's not... Uh, uh, it's, not <laughs> it's not Cassis. No, no, it's not Cassis. Cassis is playing three copies of Noxious Grasp and two copies of Allegiance End. Now, these are great against Elks and Okos and, and, and various Eldraine cards of all types. Not so good against Old Mate Cavalier of Flame. Right, and here's the thing. you got to be aggressive against the Jeskai Fires deck but you're not set up for it. So, but however, it does get much better post sideboard, mm -hmm. especially access to duress is going to be a key. Oh yeah, and of course, Thrashy B, that Thrashing Brontodon come in, uh, knock out the Veil of Fires, which really does take the wind out of the sails of the Fires deck. Now, both of these players are off to a slow start here. We've had a Falmire Knight drawing a card. We're now gonna see Raska as the first uh, sort of headline act of this game. Kowalski's hand is set up to uh, is set up to really contest the board, but Cassis is not letting him do it. He's not playing any creatures. Yeah, that's the thing is, you got, I mean, both hands kind of tell the tale. You have a bunch of Deafening Clearings on one side, and you got a few Murderous Riders on the other. It's actually kind of unfortunate that the first threat is Vraska, because that's one of the cleanest answers to the prison realm mm. in Kowalski's yeah. hand. And Kowalski knows Main decks are open. That means you know there's two Vraskas, and that's already one lockdown. And if you prison realm with Vraska and your only answer is Vraska, do you it's really? It's not <laughs> right. I yeah. mean, technically, you can free the Vraska very briefly. But look, Cassis at the moment, uh, I think he's he, he's sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Kowalski holding all the answers and even does have Drawn from Dreams ready to go if he wants to uh, start to improve the, his hand even more. I think that's what he's going to go for here. I like this. The Vraska isn't putting on a huge amount of pressure. Cassis at this stage not looking to sacrifice his permanence for fun and profit. And as a result, Kowalski now has kind of got the turn off, right? He's, he, you know, Cassis has come in, he's, you know, he's the boss of the newspaper and he says, listen, mate, have the weekend to yourself. You know, go do something nice, go down to the beach or something, enjoy yourself, draw some dreams, see some fish. And as a result, Kowalski now is going to uh, improve his hand, which already is pretty stacked. Yeah, a lot of removal. Uh, that said, I think uh, since we had Kowalski on the draw, that should be a discard with eight cards. But yeah, trying to get to a Fires of Invention in order to have next turn something like Fires of Invention plus Prison Realm mm -hmm. on Vraska, yep. or kind of anything else. Uh, there are two turns before the Vraska actually becomes important. Um, but yeah, like you see it. Oh, another Vraska, but again, as you, as we mentioned before, sacri freeing a Vraska from a Prison Realm with Vraska no, is not the that, that jailbreak doesn't go <laughs> particularly particularly well here. Let's see what the next move is from Cassis. I think it's just going to be another Filemire Knight here. Yes, indeed. Profane Insight, the play. Draw a card, lose a life. Love that card, Falmire Knight, does it all. But uh, a slower, more interactive hand from Cassis there, double murderous rider, in addition to that uh, second of Raska Golgari Queen. But we might see these Death Touch 1 1s come into play here, or maybe a Paradise Druid. It's actually uh, 
I can understand this. Uh, there are not that many cards that are relevant in Cassis's deck, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so might as well, and a 1-1 one -one Death Touch doesn't exactly accelerate your clock that much. All right, so instead of uh, leaving it around, we're going to sacrifice it to that Rouska, draw an extra card, and Cassis keeping his hand nice and stacked. The late game probably favors Kowalski, even with cards like Liliana and what have you from the deck of Cassis. Oh, Kowalski is just going to be able to start kicking goals with both feet once this Fires of Invention comes online. There it is, and exactly what you want to do after that, of course, is immediately start to get some value from it. There's that Prison Realm. Yeah, gets it out of the board. And, it, and from now on, we're going to see two very powerful spells. Mm -hmm. Already time. in hand, we have kind of the standard Splinter Twin. Uh, Embercleave was one of them with Register. The other one is Cavalier of Flame and yeah. Cavalier of Gales. Now, the, the, the Falmire Knight is actually very relevant here against that Cavalier of Flame because uncontested if the... Oh, wow. With an attack <laughs> here, actually. You know what? I'm going to eat my words here. Kowalski can do so much damage next turn. He can go double Cavalier, activate the, uh, the Cavalier of Flame three times, and I don't think we have numbers that go high enough to calculate that damage. What about 17? Is it 17? It, it is exactly 17. Is it exactly 17? Yeah. Okay, so he's going to be one short here as we see well, Braska sacrifice the Falmire Knight. But this is going to be a huge attack from Gregor Kowalski here. And this is what this is where the deck started, right? This was the Fires of Invention, the Martin User, uh, Andre Strasky sort of week one strategy, the Czech Cavalry, they called it. And there's a foul my night as well to stem the bleeding a little bit. But let's have, like, check this turn out from Kowalski. It's going to be huge. Here we go. Yeah, and, but because of this Falmar Knight, where we're most likely going to see from this Cavalier combo, apart from drawing all the cards like you could ever dream cards, of. Exactly. Again, we don't have numbers that go that high. It's uh, getting rid of the Vraska Golgari Queen. And at that point, all the Vraskas are gone. You never have to worry about that card again. All right, here is Cavalier of Gales. So a little brainstorm effect here. We draw three, put two cards back on the top. Now, those two don't have to come from the cards that were drawn. Now, often this is an interaction we see in Legacy uh, in, uh, in conjunction with Fetchlands to sculpt the perfect hand. And the Pole certainly has had the chance to do that. Drawn from Dreams, now a Cavalier of Gales. So the MPL Superstar will have a hand that uh, is very well set up to uh, hustle and bustle against Cassis here. The, the kind of funny thing is you put the cards you want to keep on top of the library just because with the Cavalier of Flames ability, you sure. want to discard the cards you don't want and get back to the cards you do want. So let's see here now. This is the, uh, yeah, this is a weird twist <laughs> on the old Brainstorm fetch, isn't it? So Kowalski now, Cavalier of Flame, discard time wipe two lands and is going to draw Kenrith the Returned King and a copy of Deafening Clarion. In addition to what looks like, that's an adventure card of some kind, I'm guessing a Fae of Wishes. Good eye. Now, Kowalski here is going to be able to activate the Cavalier of Flame. This is where the Jeskai Fires deck takes it to the next level. Doesn't pay mana for the spells, all of a sudden can start using activated abilities on its, on its uh, play, uh, creatures here. And that's why we see this Planeswalker go down. Really tidy turn from Kowalski. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, we got to play 10 mana worth of cards. Yeah, it seems good. Seems uh, good. For, well, yeah, I, I like it. It's not so bad. Not so bad. I mean, no one's complaining about that. Back to Cassis now, who is leaning heavily on this Falmire Knight to uh, to keep the wolves at bay. Yeah, has two murderous riders that are finally unlocked. But even if that does, you know, will kill the Cavaliers. He's got he's got he's got Buckley's chance, mate. Another Cavalier off the top. Kowalski has got Fay of Wishes uh, to go and get anything from casualties of war to plain wide celebration here out of his board. He's just a little short from casting a huge 8-drop, but I mean, even just Nickel Bolas Dragon God is going to do a huge amount of work here. Kowalski firmly in the driver's seat. His hands at 10-2, and two, and he is off down the highway like a shot. Springsteen banging in his ears. He's having a great time here. Oh, this is amazing. I love this deck already. <laughs> I mean, I'm such a fan of Fires of Invention uh, and the decks that it has sort of, uh, you know, propagated. We've seen all sorts of silly nonsense enabled by this card, but it's got a built-in stopgap. It's very difficult to break it completely in half. You can only cast two cards, and there's only so much you can do with that. The most important part is you can't cast spells during your opponent's turn, yeah. because that would be, a, that yeah. would be the real powerful mm. kicker. And you just get blown out by... by interaction when you you know you're forced to play at sorcery speed and you can only cast two cards a turn and here we're seeing just good honest removal is going to remove take care of that cavalier of gales it gets shuffled back into the library of course kowalski's going to scry two and uh i don't know i mean look things aren't looking good for cassis but he's uh, he's fighting hard 
I mean, he can fight hard all he wants. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm trying to build a little bit of dramatic tension here, Eduardo. I'm trying to build. Come on, this journey. The, cavalry, with me. the cavalry has come, and the return yeah. kill will join them probably quite yes. soon. This is very much the charge of the heavy brigade here. This one's going to turn out a little bit better for uh, Kowalski rather than it did for those Napoleonic heroes. But instead, now, I think we're just going to see a granted cast from Fay of Wishes, perhaps. I actually wonder what to get here. Casualties of War, obviously. Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the options. I'll give you the options. He's got Brazen right. Burrow, Casualties of War, Chandra, Disenchant, Enter the God Eternals, Garruk, Mystical Dispute, Nickel Bolas, Plain White Celebration, Sorcerer Spyglass, and Timur Uwipa. So he's obviously looking, thinking about the Dragon God. I like this pick. It's a good all-round choice. It's going to continue to push you further and further ahead. Um, and uh, there's very few board states on which Nicol Bolas Dragon God is not a powerhouse play. Right. And, and the nice part about this is another card that Kowalski can get access to is Plain White Celebration. Yeah, yeah, the next granted already. can get that, and that would win the game on the spot if there wasn't another Murderous Rider. There is. However, late game, you get Plain White Celebration, get back a bunch of Cavaliers and Nicol Bolas, and mm -hmm. you should be able to bury... Uh, Cassis in a sea of card quality. I mean, the other thing is just make four two twos, give them all haste and plus a million, plus a million, get in there for I don't even know how much damage here. So Kowalski, as we say, an embarrassment of riches. An embar his, his cup runneth over. But there is that murderous rider bringing the uh, Nicol Bolas to a swift end. Back to Cassis now. In hand for him, Paradise Druid on the double. And I think he's just drawn a land for the turn. Yeah, I mean, we're going to see... You mentioned a couple of hasty, high damage tutus. Yep. That sounds great. Yeah, it is. It's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. Fave Wish is still in hand here for the Polish superstar. We can even clear the way with uh, Daphne and Clarion this turn, and then a little later on do that combo. Yeah. No, I don't see, but not even gonna get a chance to do it. Cassis recognizing the writing on the wall. He's gonna pack him up and we're going to game number two where things well look, hopefully for the American are gonna turn out a little bit uh, a little bit more favorably. But look, full credit to Gregor Kowalski who has uh, he has come ready to uh, ready to take some names and he certainly did it there. A very convincing performance from the Jess Guy Fires list. Now my friends, we're gonna take a quick break here from Richmond. We're gonna be back with more live magic, more Jess Guy Fires, more Golgari adventures. But uh, in the meantime, stick with us. We'll be live back from Mythic Championship 6 after this. I'm here on the floor of Mythic Championship number 6 with Piotr Gogolski, and we're going to get a chance to pick his brains a little bit about how the season's going so far and maybe some big expectations for what we might see from him in this event. So, Piotr, in terms of where things have gone for you so far in the season, what are the kind of the edited highlights, I suppose? Uh, the season has been going well for me right now. Uh, right now, I am in a spot where I am both uh, relatively likely to just stay within the amount of uh, points necessary to make it into the MPL next year, while it's not necessarily mu very likely for me to hit the world's threshold. So I'm kind of like uh, not expecting to much to change. I would need to, to spike a tournament very, very high to, for things to change. So in terms of your preparation, does that impact how you make any choices? Like, is there a goal to like really go for it and try and uh, make it through to the, the upper echelons, get to that world championship? Or is it about maintaining your position, being good and solid through the season and getting some more of that MPL goodness next year? Well, it's certainly the fact that like I'm, you know, probably neither moving up or down, I uh, it kind of impacted the amount of uh, enthusiasm that I had for preparation and I did uh, try to choose a good deck, a strong deck and uh, a well-placed one, but uh, also like didn't uh, stress over it uh, too hard and uh, spend a lot of time exploring the new Pioneer format. I know that you do love to look at a new constructed format and figure out what to do. I'm fully expecting to see great things from you when it comes to helping everyone figure out what they want to do in Pioneer. Um, but in terms of your testing for this one, has it been more constructed, which I think of as being more your focus, or have you been doing a little bit more limited on this one? Well, exactly because constructed is typically more of my focus, and uh, because the standard format seemed uh, somewhat, uh, maybe not solved, but dominated by a single strategy to a greater extent than typically it is, I decided to stick with the obvious strategy and just play drafts as I spend much more time uh, preparing for Limited, which is you know, typically what is uh, my weaker point. If you want to top 8 a Mythic Championship, then you typically do it on the back of a good Limited record, and I like frequently have good records at the MCs and uh, 
like then my limited score is you know three three, two four four two, and well that's so that's you know if I if I six so my draft I might as well just uh, win it all. All right, bold words from Piotr here. We will get a chance to see exactly how he does as Mythic Championship six develops. Welcome back to continued coverage of Mythic Championship 6. We are live from Virginia in the United States of America. My name is Riley Knight, joined by Eduardo Saj Gallic, And uh, our players down the feature match here, Eli Cassis and Gregor Kowalski, still shuffling up and getting ready. And as a result, I want to I discuss an interesting sort of uh, wrinkle in this matchup here, Eduardo. Now, generally, obviously, you come to a game of Magic, you've got a 60-card main deck, you've got a 15-card sideboard. Fae of Wishes really changes that equation because if you're going to build what we call a, a wish board, right, a, 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 a sideboard that is designed to have cards plucked from it for use in game one, it does actually kind of eat into, or kind of cannibalize a lot of your sideboard space. Gregor Kowalski has come without a full 15-card sideboard, if you want to look at it like that. Right, because you have flexibility in game one, you can get something like a Casualties of War mm. on demand, mm. a Chantra Awakened of Inferno on demand. Probably not, you're not going to main that Casualties no. of War. So at that point, you have way less options. That means that your deck has to be way, have much more flexible cards in the main because you can't change too much. Too much, exactly. I mean, there are some cards in uh, in Kowalski's deck that do come in multiples in the sideboard, and uh, obviously they can be chopped and changed, but for the most part, it does take up at a fair bit of room. We're going to head down to the feature match area right now to get underway with these two fellas once again. Just to remind ourselves, Ely Cassis is on Golgari Adventures and Gregor Kowalski is on Jeskai Fires. Both these fellas at a 9-2 and two record. Very respectable start to their Mythic Championships so far. And they will be gunning hard for that coveted slot in the top eight later on today. Lovestruck Beast is going to power at a 1-1 thanks to Heart's Desire. And now Kowalski kicking things off with a Temple of Triumph. And uh, Edgewall Innkeeper going to draw a card with Foulmire Knight. Much better start, much more convincing start from Cassis here. He's really uh, putting the pedal to the metal. Yeah, especially with that Edgewall Innkeeper. Not so much the 1-1 one -one body, although it is relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, but Foulmire Knight being able to draw a card right away and any top deck adventure being able to be deployed, like this Lovestruck Beast drawing a card and allowing to put pressure without missing a beat, without yep. running out of resources. And I want to point out something really important here. We're going to see a fire, uh, we're going to see a, a deafening clarion here. Uh, yeah, Eli, Eli knows it, we know it, you know it, everyone knows it. But one thing I really want to point out is that usually if you played out three one ones and get him clarion away, that's a disaster here. It's not at all. Cassis has kept card parity. He's got a 5-5 five five that's ready to rumble. Because that edge wall inkeeper drew him two cards, he's fine. He's fine to have lost it at this stage with a deafening clarion. He knows that that sort of stuff is going to happen. Right, exactly as you point out. But one thing here, no 1-1. One, one. So that, that Love Sex Beast is staying at home until uh, the arrival of uh, an ill innkeeper or another uh, human. But yeah, the main, main card here, now that the Deafening Clearing is gone, go for Rankle Master of Pranks. And as you can hear there, discard draw. It makes the the draw is probably because Cassis is running out of a beat, mm -hmm. probably worried about not being able to curve out. Uh, because normally you, against a control deck, making them discard can be quite, is probably the most relevant of those abilities. Kowalski here, he's got a stacked hand, discarded a Teferi Time Raveler, but found a Deafening Clarion, going to use that more or less as a Doom Blade to take care of the Rankle there. Now this leaves Cassis with a Cavalier of Night and a Vraska Golgari Queen, but there's an exciting top-end option here in Liliana, Dreadhorde General. Now that's the card... That's the sort of card that can overrun the Jeskai Fires list very easily if it goes unchecked. Yeah, it's one of the top-end friends that works because, again, the Jeskai Fires deck can't play counter magic. Fires of Invention does not work mm. with counter magic. So you only see something like Mystical Dispute because you want to, you know, trade in the early game and then go over the top. You might also see Aphergoss not relevant here anyways at, and not in the list. But no fret is bad. Even a 4-5 lifelinker that can return a creature from the graveyard. It's mm -hmm. good to run on turn five because you just need to go curve. It's turn one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. All the way up the curve. And that's what exactly what Cassis has done here. Kowalski answering it at least somewhat with a Fires of Invention into Teferi. This is exactly what you want to do the turn you cast the Fires. You need to have a follow-up play. And one that is stemming the bleeding a little bit here is very, very good for Kowalski. If you'd fight off a, a Drawn from Dreams, he'd start to fall behind. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is, 
as you mentioned, like that fires an invention does something very important, which is when you're playing one spell per turn, it's it's sometimes really hard to catch up because that spell has to essentially buy you multiple cards, be able to, and then you have to deal with the next threat mm -hmm. and the next threat. But with fires an invention, a power of that card is not just that you answer; it's also you threaten. Yes. So, do an answer and a threat in the same turn. And at that point, it's harder for your opponents to keep up. And this is why we see cards like Cavalier of Flame. Keeps the cards flowing, separates the wheat from the chaff while also beating down like a champ. Cassis here is, I mean, the only beating he's taken right now is from himself. He shocked himself three times with that overgrown tomb. But to power out Liliana, the Dreadhorde General, that is a price he is willing to pay. Down she comes makes a 2-2, and Cassis, I love the way that he has diversified his threats, and he said to Kowalski, hey, buddy, buddy, you've got to answer this, or you're in big trouble. Yeah, and, I mean, one piece of trouble, that was a missed land drop last turn, but drew the Fabled Passage just in time to play Cavalier Flame. The best draw now, if Kowalski's willing to risk it, is to go Cavalier Flame, discard a few cards, try to get to a 2 of Cavalier of Gales, because if Kowalski can hit that, then that would be that would kill Liliana Dreadhorde General. A Prison Realm would look like an entitled seed option, but Cassis is ready with a Vraska Golgarian Queen. Yeah, it. tough spot here for Kowalski. The Poles gonna have to think long and hard about this because he does have that Cavalier, which can get haste. He's got a, a Kenrith in hand as well. Kenrith, the Return King, also able to rumble. But the fact of the matter is, it can't get past the Lovestruck Beast without an activation of something like the green ability, which which Kowalski can't do here. It's but, gonna he's gonna have trouble uh, actually meaningfully contesting this Liliana. So his only option may be to just search for that Cavalier of Gales and find an evasive threat. Nope, he's gonna go for Kenrith. This actually can do the trick because Kenrith's ability doesn't just give haste; it also gives trample. Oh, okay, all right. So that how much does that change things? Let's see. So. With Ca we can activate Cavalier Flame's ability twice in, the, in a spot like this. So that it's 11 power up to 15. Mm -hmm. So we can't uh, so we can't take down Cassis. There's seven power. There's seven in defense. There's seven seven toughness to seven trample toughness. over. That's yeah, right. Yes. So the, so but that is enough to get rid of Liliana Dreadhorde General. Okay, so so Cassis now can give trample to his oh, sorry uh, Kowalski can give trample to his attackers, which means that the five five and the two two aren't the most effective blockers. Not like not how you'd think anyway. So Kenrith, the Return King, really just doing it all, slicing and dicing here making sure that those creatures can get in. I think Cassis is starting to realize that uh, he might be up a certain creek without a certain propulsion device here. Yeah, and now uh, just trying to decide what... Uh, because the Lovestruck Beast will trade, essentially, uh, with one of these creatures, mm -hmm. decides that Kenrif, the Return King, um, is essentially what to go for. Remember that Kenrif can gain five life per activation. Yeah. Yeah, that, when you're uh, trying to put pressure... <laughs> a huge amount of life. So there we see the blocks. The other liability here, Cavalier of Flame, when it dies, of course, it's going to deal damage on the way out. So Cassis has been put between a rock and a hard place here by Kowalski, who has found, I mean, a really, really clever combination of cards to get himself out of this out of this mess. Uh, the Liliana was threatening to take over the game, but Kowalski, look, we said, we said, Cassis is, answering, is asking the question. It's like, mate, if you can't answer this, this card, you are just Stone Cold Deadski. But Kowalski's like, well, do you want better? Here's the answer. Yeah, and, and you still have a fret on the board. That's the power of Fires of Invention. Yeah. We Look, we had 15 mana worth of, of play here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Kowalski has basically spent 15 mana in one turn because of those activated abilities, because of the Fires of Invention, and now all of a sudden, no Liliana Dreadhorde General, no board presence to speak of. Back to Cassis, sitting on a Cavalier of Night, Nebraska Golgari Queen. But there's no way he can dump 15 mana worth of stuff into play. That's just not happening. That's not how mid-range works. All right, here's a duress now. Yeah, and, and has a second duress available, so can at least pick Kowalski's hand apart. But that Castle Vantress, if Kowalski ever picks up another blue source, will be able to get to much more relevant cards. Uh, as for the pick here, Drawn from Dreams with a single duress would by far be the best pickup. So the question is, what do you... Yeah, <laughs> I like yeah, this. double duress. Love yeah. it. Love it. Yeah, yeah. So away go both Teferi and Drawn from Dreams here as Cassis starts to tear 
the uh, the hand of Kowalski to shreds. Murderous Rider on the Cavalier of Flame. So damage control mode here for Cassis, and he's just going to hope that the top of Kowalski's library doesn't treat him too kindly. And I tell you what, I love this approach from Cassis. He was all offense, no defense. That is not an approach that was going to work from him here, and he's decided I need to take a different tack. Right, well, you play with what you draw. Oh, yeah. So, Duress really nice to set the save. Ooh, but wait, is that a Henry Kenrif? off the top. That is a spicy... That is a spicy, spicy slice of pepperoni here for Kowalski. All of a sudden, he's going to start to rumble once again. Can dump a bunch of mana into it here. He's going to draw a card as well. Love this. Look at that. Draw a card. Can still give it haste and get in for five. Doesn't find anything too useful, but still. Tidy little attack. Halving the American's life total. And once again, Cassis is on the ropes. And, and unfortunately here for Cassis, that can, with the Deafening Clarion in hand, it's going to be really hard to mount a defense mm. against the Kenrith. Yes, absolutely. If Kenrith has a 5-5, as a 5-5 with a Tolstoy-esque list of abilities, Cassis, I think, needs another creature. Oh, no, he can... Oh, he's a little short of casting that Cavalier of Night to, uh, to take out the Kenrith. If he finds a land, he can do it. Off the top, there's oh. Liliana. Was that just, is that, did he know that was there? Oh, it was scryed probably from a Temple of, Ma of Malady last turn. Okay, all right, because I was going to say, that was that was a Gabriel <laughs> Nassim cruel ultimatum-like rip, if not. And the ca just the casual casual attitude with which he ripped it on, uh, uh, whacked it onto the battlefield here. Yeah. Very cashed in for a card. There's a prison realm. Oh, my goodness. There's no brakes on the Kowalski train. Although that prison realm is... Uh, Oh, while, while, while Kowalski is going to read Cavalier of so Night. Which, which he knows, it, by the way, for those yep. who just joined us, he knows it's in the hand. It was bounced previously with a, uh, a Teferi about 100 million years ago. Yeah, but here for Kowalski, that Prison Realm might actually be one of the worst possible draws since uh, Cassis has access in hand mm. to Vraska Golgari Queen. So that Prison Realm is going to mean Liliana Dreadhorde General essentially gains four loyalty counters. That's a good point. That's a good point now. So Cassis, I mean, look, Kowalski has to play it. He has to answer that that uh, Dreadhorde General. He, he is not on the front foot right now. He's looking to get himself back into this game. His hand isn't particularly proactive, just a time wipe and a deafening clarion, so very reactive hand. But look, you can't fault Kowalski for that play. He's got, he's, he, he obviously has to answer the, uh, the Liliana. Yeah, but he scribed to the top, and with Cassis at five life, there's not much needed to take the game down. Something like a Cavalier of yep. Flame, mm -hmm. if there's not a blocker, but thankfully Lilina is good at one thing, and that's making the army. All right, so the Golgari Queen is joined by the Dreadhorde General, and she ticks upstairs to make a 2-2 zombie. And here's a 2-3 lifelinker to join it as well. All of a sudden, Cassis, man, this game is, this game has had more swings in my local playground, I'll tell you that much. It's gone back and forth. And now Kowalski starts to brick. He, he kept that one on top, though. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, that's actually really smart from uh, Kowalski. He kept a blue source on top in order to activate Castle Ventress before using Teferi Time Raveler's ability. And with Fires of Invention, oh, you can use... Oh, so smart. Oh, my goodness. 200 IQ plays here from Kowalski. Prison Realm? I mean... The problem with Prison Realm here is, you know Vraska Golgari Queen is still in place. So if you Prison Realm, Liliana, Dreadhorde, General, wipe the board afterwards, well, that Vraska Golgari Queen is only one turn away from getting rid of it. Mm. The question is, do you have to? And Kowalski seems to say yes. It does cry one. And that's, I think, the, a good tiebreaker. Okay. All right. Well... After the scry here, still an activation of Teferi ready to go. And that can just destroy the zombie, which isn't too bad. So here it is. Activate, bounce the zombie. So it's just destroyed, of course. That's how it works when you bounce a token. And finds that prison realm scry to the top. So this is a more of a band-aid than anything else here for Kowalski as he tries to take care of that Liliana for now. But is that a scry to the top again? Maybe he's thinking about it. Bottom's going to go to the bottom. All right. He thinks he can do better. And, and he can also scry on the upkeep. So uh, Kowalski's still in a decent shape. Uh, we're going to see the Deafening clear in here just to make sure that Teferi Time Raveler sticks in play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, plus one, minus one, that minus three, that's another card. So 
I mean, both players are kind of card starved. They both would like mm -hmm. to have access to more cards. And that's where this Vraska is going to become very important. It's an answer to Prison Realm, but it's also a way for Cassis to draw a card in a very resource light situation. Absolutely. Both these players looking to get ahead on cards. And I love the way that uh, Cassis is able to cash some of those lands in for extra value. Here's a Cavalier of Knight. That's just going to be a 4 5 lifelinker here. No further value to be gained from its first ability. And of course, playing out those lands, ready to sacrifice them to the Golgari Queen. Right. And there we go. Upkeep, Scry. This is a classic play from Jeskai Fires. Obviously, the, the, the fact that it won't use its mana to cast spells means that once the Fires of Invention is online, Castle Vantress, a really, really important way for the deck to dig to the cards it needs. Uh, if you're interested in learning more <laughs> about the deck here, you can actually uh, have a look uh, on Channel Fireball. Uh, Martin User wrote a primer for the list. The strategy hasn't tra changed too much in the intervening time, uh, and it sort of gives you a little primer as to how, uh, how to navigate situations like these. Yeah, I, it was a deck I was encouraged, uh, enthusiastic about playing before I learned about some other Planeswalker. But anyways, in this spot, did Kowalski just check the sideboard? He if did. I was if I was gonna seize, that is not a move I would be happy with. Now this is very you know if you've played a game of modern and you're playing against a blue player and they draw their card, kind of look at it and then check over their graveyard, you're like, okay, they drew a Snapcaster Mage. They know they're just they're not even trying to hide it. So this could either be an Oscar-worthy performance here from Kowalski or a Fay of Wishes on top of his library. It's one or the other here. Let's see what it is. Draws. If it if it is a Fay of Wishes, oh. which it is, and the Oscar goes to not Gregor Kowalski because <laughs> there was very much method acting there. So he's going to be able to cast Granted and then get whatever he wants out of the sideboard. Now, Casualties of War is obviously an attractive option. He can kill the Vraska, which is an answer to the answer to the uh, Liliana here. But apart from that, I don't know. What else are you looking at here? It's kind of close because Casualties of War, the issue with it is killing... Ca it would destroy Cavalier of Night, and that would get back a Fret, um, which would fret, which would get this to Ferry. But it does cleanly answer the Vraska which he needs to and do. the largest Fret. So we're going to go Planeswalker, we're going to go Creature, and we're also going to take care of a land here. So Stone Cold 3 for 1, and that's just the way it goes with Casualties of War. It's hard not to get... <laughs> it's, hard, it's very hard... It's very difficult not to end up ahead with a Casualties of War. Yeah, but it, and as you mentioned, the Death Trigger of the Cavalier of Night is going to bring back... What are we looking for here? Okay, Casual Innkeeper, I like that. Yeah. Again, the priority is we're both light on resources. Lovestruck Beast will not take care of Kowalski's full life total in time. So I'm just going to take the card that gives me the highest chance to get out of this resource light situation. And that's a really nice pickup. Even at six life, you got to draw cards. Got to draw cards. Let's have a look here from the uh, Castle Lock Thwain there. And now it's Cassis's turn to have a look through his graveyard. I wonder what he's found here. Order of Midnight. Order of Midnight. All right. So that, yeah, again, once again, the tell. You draw the snap cast, you start digging through your graveyard. Same again, you, you, you draw the order. There, there is a way to avoid that, which is that you remember what your graveyard does or you put it in a certain position, but it All can be really right. rough. All right, that. Mr. Eidetic Memory. I'm sure it must be nice to live in that world. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I, I don't work yeah, like I don't that. know either. I, I also, I also <laughs> exactly, look at my yeah. graveyard. It's like when you see top players doing it, like just remembering everything is so difficult. So, uh, yeah, it's it's fine. Also, both players are drawing cards they're using right away very clearly. Um, but I, I would say still that Kowalski's ahead because while Cassis kind of rebuilding, right? Innkeeper, mm -hmm. Order of Midnight. Draw a card. Yep. Love it. There it is. Yep. The problem and, is, and it all was predicated on that uh, that uh, Castle Lock Thwain. Just needed an extra little uh, extra little bump there, extra little bit of a uh, bit of uh, momentum, a bit of extra card advantage, and and it all started with that Lock Thwain. One of my favorite designs in in recent Magic history. Love Castle Lock Thwain, the design on that. Yeah. By the way, here Kowalski is thinking because um, if if Kowalski taps to Scry, then none of the creatures, uh, Cavalier of Flame, for example, would not be able to have haste, and that would be lethal damage, which is why... Uh, and the alternative is just to draw, because you can go Fae of Wishes plus Time Wipe, oh, he's found but it. he drew lethal. He's found That's it. much better. He's found it. He's ripped lethal off the top of the deck. <laughs> Quick check of Order of Midnight. It can't block. Let's get back that Fae of Wishes, make them uh, both hasty, and get in for lethal. I have to say... Idli Cassis put on quite a stellar recovery effort there, really digging in deep, trying to get his, uh, his snoot back above water. But at the end of the day, Gregor Kowalski takes it out very cleanly indeed after a, uh, a stellar performance from his Jeskai Fires list. Yeah, that was really impressive to watch. And I, I think this matchup is really bad for the Golgari Adventure deck. I mean, it's just a go-over-the-top mm. 
tap out control deck that can really reverse the course of action, goes a little bigger, and can be really hard for uh, a mid-range card advantage deck like the Golgari Adventure deck to, to take over as a result. Let's move to one of our back tables now. Christian Hauk facing off against Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa, two MPL superstars going at it head to head. And, uh, well, Dama de Rosa on a deck that we've all seen before, of course, with Simic Food, and Hulk instead on Sultai Food, the black splash there for cards like Casualties of War, Vraska, and, of course, Noxious Grasp. And if you've seen uh, Frank uh, Carson's metagame breakdown, the reason Sultai Food was the most popular of the food variants is because of access to four main deck copies of Noxious Grasp, presuming that you needed an answer to cards like Nissa, Who Shakes the World, and Oko that were as cheap and efficient as possible. And I think the other thing that uh, that Frank mentioned as well is that playing black or not playing black didn't really move the needle on win percentages. There was no huge advantage either way. It was like one percent the difference in win rate between uh, Sultai and Simic. So it really just depends on uh, on your flavour. Tell me, what's your flavour? In they come. Is that a three three attacking, or is it tap being tapped for mana here? I'd guess it's tapping for mana. Seeing as it shouldn't tap to attack. I wonder, obviously we're joining this game in the middle, so it's difficult to tell where we are. I would guess that Free Free had it attacked Oko Fief of Crowns, mm -hmm. since it's unlikely that it that it went to one loyalty that easily. Yeah, it's a very odd thing to see. I mean, that's why we have D12s on our Okos, right? It's because he's usually just so loyal. So loyal! Which a lot of people certainly appreciate. Oh, no, no. Oh, uh, wow, it was a response to yeah, the exchange. The, the old swapperino. Yeah, yeah, the old switcheroo, as they call it. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense now with uh, PV taking his time to think through that one there. Yeah, probably floating mana here in order to cast it Brazen Borrow that was in the uh, adventure from earlier. Yes, you can see it off there in the, at the top of the screen in the Exile Zone. And Hulk now. Looks like he's ready to rumble with that Hydroid Crisis. Relatively small one, just on two loyalty. Two loyalty for the Crisis? Two plus one plus one counters, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, there's floating mana. Paolo can do something first. All right, this is going to go down. Takes two damage down to four loyalty. Hulk takes two himself after that watery grave. And for five mana, we're going to see a Nissa of his own. Plays it post-combat, interestingly, uh, rather than pre-combat, in order to make sure that Paolo was out of mana, perhaps fearing something like an A for Gust. Yep, yep. And as a result now, Hulk firmly in control of this board state, it has to be said. Yeah, and with that breeding pool gone, the mass man... Ooh, that... Oh, wow. Paolo's hand is full of mirror breakers between mass manipulation and the top deck, Gadwick the Wizened. Mm, Gadwick the Wizened here. The Wizened or the Wizened? The Wizened. One of the two. We're not the wiser for that no, one. No, <laughs> we're not the wiser for that. Gadwick, Gadwick the Wizard. As well as another copy of Brazen Borrower, one in the uh, in the adventure zone as well, off with the Bureau of Balance. Yeah, and here you see Paolo doing math uh, between Nissa's ability to double mana and a breeding pool. That's a lot of breeding pools for Paolo, which shockingly sometimes is the best card in the deck. It's actually just the best card in standard. I read, I mean, I read, I didn't, I didn't vet this, but I read on Twitter, which is, I mean, people aren't allowed to lie on the internet, right? So that <laughs> must be true. Someone posted on Twitter and said that there Sorry. are, there are more breeding pools registered for this tournament than uh, forests, uh, than than mountains, plains, and swamps combined. Well, that's so the it really is. It really is the age of Simic. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, as a Simic mage, uh, be careful what you wish oh, for. Oh, <laughs> look, I, I, I welcome our elf, mutant, warrior, crab, jellyfish, hydra, beast overlords. Let me be the first to say that. Let me be the first to say that. Looking at the amount of mana Paolo can generate, that's six. Breeding pool would make it eight. An untapped from Minnesota would make it ten. That would be a mass manipulation for X equals three. And you can take over another Nissa. The Oko, and how about a land as well, probably? Yeah, yeah, bring that one right back. All right, so here it is, an activation of Nissa. Oh, we're, lo we're looking at uh, Gatwick here, because uh, Paolo wouldn't be able to mass manipulate here. Uh, wait, that's... Oh, yeah, uh, is that enough blue mana? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Four yeah, blue yeah. mana from the Paradise. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. We have Breeding Pool, yeah, and yeah, we have... Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Okay. So yeah. four, four blue mana from the two Breeding Pools, the Island and the Paradise Druid there, which is enough. And now X equals, I don't even know how many. Graham's number, it would seem. Or three. Yeah, three also is fine. They're very close 
on a cosmic scale. Actually, no, they're not. Graham's number is enormous. But the point is here, this is a huge play from PV. Yeah, this is going to allow Paolo to really take over. Um, you see uh, Christian tapping for food here in response to the steal just because uh, by taking uh, Hawks of Renissa, uh, you would be able to make a free free to destroy Oko. If Paolo decided not to steal Oko, then I'd be very surprised if Christian Hawk taps out here since you'd want to protect it. But there's a really, really spicy card in Christian Hawk's hand in that Command the Dread Horde. That could really change things here. Both players' hands are kind of stacked with Hulk holding on to a Nissa who shakes the world and Ugin as well as that command, the Dread Horde. The graveyards don't look like there's much in there. It seems like we're in the first stage of the game where only the, the first couple of 10 mana spells are cast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eduardo, what planet do we live on, mate? What planet do we live on? It's the first, it's the early stage, you know? It's, we're only casting mass manipulation for three. This is the early game, my dude. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so another Nissa replacing. Look, uh, look at PV's how good that mass manipulation was. I'm going to take everything you have and kill whatever's relevant. Yeah. That's a huge, big swinging play. And all of a sudden, the ball back in the Brazilians' court. Back to Hulk now, who is going to face a brazen borrower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, when, when we're returning a goose to the hand, you know that things are not, are either very, very bad for you or yep. very, very good. It's it's one or the other. Yeah, you, you're up. At, you're either at uh, one end of the, or the other of the spectrum here as uh, PV bounces the goose. The goose is 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 not loose. The goose has been has been penned away once again. And and it's worth noting here um, that Paolo does this because the most important research. Uh, resource that Hawk had access to was mana by far. Yep. So it's worth delaying Hawk's mana by a turn because Paolo will be able to deal a lot of damage uh, thanks to this Nissa who shakes the world and the cohort of lands. And on top of that, you get to after the attack you do to do uh, Gadwick the the what the wizened the wise the wizened the wizened. Let's just go for uh, for old mate Gadders. Oh, oh, made Gaddix. Yeah, yep. that works. Yep. Um, which will draw... I, I can count the number of cards, but sufficient is my is uh, where I'd see it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> we're, we're getting a real show here as we see uh, the uh, an activation of, uh, of Oko here. Yeah, turning the Hydroid Krasis into a Nelk. Again, the, the because the base power and toughness of Krasis, uh, of the Krasis is a 0-0. Zero, zero. This mm -hmm. puts it to free free. The counters still stay there, so it makes it a decent blocker for these lands. So now there's a small decision by Paolo. But the idea here would be to do something like Gatwick, draw a ton of cards, play Brazen Borrow, tap down the, the Krasis, and lower, do a combination of lowering Hauk's life toll to a very low number, and or get Oko, Thief of Crowns, off the table. Next up on the docket for the Brazilian here. It's just all three threes all day as far as he's concerned. Four animated lands. Only, of, I mean, how many of them actually belong to PV here? <laughs> you can kind of oh, tell no, from three the sleeve. Of them. No, no, three of them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just the beta forest there that doesn't. We kind of had swaps going around, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, here, lend me. I'll lend you this card. Give me that one. I'll swap you this. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a trading card game, right? Magic's <laughs> a trading card game. These players just very, very. We on, are paying the paper version. Very on, trading it's a trading card, card game, <laughs> exactly. And these players just really, really leaning into that. Nissa goes upstairs here. Wakes up another land. Yeah, the, the one breeding pool still asleep, but uh, the other ones are going to rumble in. Okay. And the hydroid crisis is offered a free block. Sorry, the Hydroid Elkus now, isn't it? It's a Jellyfish Hydra Beast Elk, except without the Jellyfish Hydra Beast part. It's just an Elk. It's just an Elk. And we, we are all Elks on this blessed day. Away goes one of them. In comes 12 damage to the German. With just a, a lonely Oko. Yeah, I'm looking at at least 10, if not 12 mana. And a Temple of Mystery to round out Paolo Vita Dama de Rose's turn. The reason we didn't see the, the Gadwick there is there's not there's not really a rush since Haug's going to have to tap out at some point to do anything. Okay. So uh, Paolo's just waiting a little bit of time because the best line is actually to get a bunch of Brazen Borrows back in play and moves li uh, Haug's life throne from 5 to 0. Oh, and the fact that he can still do that even after having attacked with all of his lands as well. Man, yeah, yeah Hauk is... Uh, Hauk is under a lot of pressure, under a boatload of pressure here. 
Yeah, there's not much that can uh, save you um, in this spot. <laughs> oh, Blight Beetle. Oh, so um, now Blight Beetle is a weird piece of technology. Um, we see it in Hauk's hand. Um, I believe, and I might be wrong. All right. And, I'm ready. And I'm, ready. I'm ready for you right. to be wrong. That's fine. But in a situation like this, I would always call a judge on an interaction. That's a bit strange. Okay. But I believe the interaction between Blight Beetle and Nissa is Nissa targets a land. Yep. Puts counters on a land, and then it becomes a creature. Also, oh, it doesn't work. That, that's what I believe the order on this that who shakes the world is. Right, because you can't put counters on your creatures, but it's not a creature to start with. That's the thing. If you put the counters on the creature after it becomes a, a, a zero zero land, it'll just die. It'll just die right. before the counters are put on. Right. So, depending on the order that Nissa, who shakes the world, is written in, yeah. it either has the land die, and yeah, it's. You put the counters on it, you untap it, then it becomes a land. So Blight Beetle does nothing against Nissa lands. Well, I mean, oh. it blocks them, right? No, no, they're still color. They're still. They're oh, still I mean, colorless. it could. Yeah, yeah they still I colorless. Mean, like they're not. Right. It doesn't protect. It could them. chump them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a two mana one one. It's no very more good, against yeah. them chumping. Blight Beetle is really just good interaction against Hydroid Crisis because Hydroid Crisis is a way to beat the the mirror. This one looks like it's in the books, however, here with Palo Vita Dama de Rosa cruising towards victory with these brazen borrowers. We can get bogged down in the rules all day and all night here, Eduardo, but this one looks to be all over Red Rover. Christian Hulk facing down, I mean, how many times lethal is it? With that Nissa activation still ready to go, three, th four, three, three lands. In addition to the brazen borrowers, Nissa goes upstairs as well. This is just an absolute beating. It's an absolute beating here. And Hauk is... Uh, not going to be able to do other, do too much other than extend the hand, I think, at this stage. He counts up his blockers, finds them a little lacking in the face of adversity, and Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa powers on to 10 and 2. He is swiftly approaching his, is it his 6th or is it his 7th or is it his 8th million top finish? at one of these big events, I'm not eight, sure. Eight million is about right. It sounds <laughs> about right. As we bring it back to the booth, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Riley Knight, joined, of course, by Eduardo Saj Gallic. We've got Time Walk Magic to bring you, of course, as well. You may have seen some superstars on the back table there. We're going to check in uh, with Tae Jun Hao from Singapore and, of course, Autumn Bird Chet from England. We are, of course, bearing down on the next round of the tournament. But in the meantime, let's get stuck in with these two. You will have noticed that both these players, a tough day in the office for uh, for both uh, Tajan Howe and Autumn Burchett here on six and five. But I love the Jeskai Fires list and I love this team of, re team of reclamation list. Tell us about the, uh, the, the tech that Burchett has brought to this tournament. Right. Well, one thing that team of reclamation does is that essentially you're drawing a lot of cards. You have Ops, you have Growth Spirals, mm -hmm. Chemistry's Insight. You know what cares about these cards? I mean, there's a sub-theme in, in Throne of Eldraine Draft, so what are we looking at? Uh, you got four Improbable Alliance in the main deck. Four Improbable Alliance. We are, we are slapping some fairies into some lanterns and we are delving those deep, dark dungeons because I, I was watching Burchett play uh, out on the floor and... Uh, they were attacking with like six or seven fairies each turn and uh, they were only getting more and more. It's, it's just, it is such a remarkably obvious inclusion in this deck, but I was I was blown away when I heard that this was the latest uh, the latest and greatest piece of tech. And it make, as you say, it makes a lot of sense. Um, not only the, 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 the fairies coming out every turn, but also you often have six plus mana lying around to loot. Yeah, it's exactly that. You, you get to especially with Wilderness Reclamation. You get access to all that mana, mm. and it's a way to beat Teferi Time Raveler, because if Teferi Time Raveler minuses, a single fairy will be enough, as long as it's, you know, you have two and one can attack. And even if Teferi pluses, it gives you an out. It also allows you to keep board control and put pressure against a control deck like this Jeskai Fires list. Let's talk a little bit about Jeskai Fires. We've already seen it. Tajan Howe's list doesn't look too different from the ones you normally see, although not as all in, I think it's fair to say, on the Fae of Wishes. Fae of Wishes in the list for Tajan Howe, but he's also playing cards like Bone Crusher Giant, cards, cards like Realm Cloak Giant, ways to interact a little more, uh, can I say, honestly, I suppose, is that the way to put it? Right, yeah, trying to just two damage for two mana. Uh, Bone Crusher Giant has interestingly been in a lot of these otherwise control decks just because it serves multiple roles. It's a removal spell that can act as a threat. So 
in control mirrors, it's a fret. And against the aggressive decks, it's your removal spell. And later on, it's something that's going to, to trade essentially mm. with kind of an attacker. Nice little split kind of card there. But uh, look, Taze deck is a little different to the one we saw Kowalski rumble with. Uh, I'd say it's less sweet. Certainly, you're not. Oh, yeah. you're, you're not. You're not. Set, you're not fetching a casualties of war from your uh, from your sideboard. But look, Fires of Vengeance is just a bonkers magic card, and I'm, I'm pleased to see it uh, getting a little more airtime here at the Mythic Championship. But uh, equally, another another equally sweet four drop enchantment is of course Birchett's uh, 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 Wilderness Reclamation, which we see played here. What a lovely card. I mean, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people who would disagree with that, but it's certainly a sweet card. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah. When Wilderness Reclamation is the hero. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You know when we're pleased to see Wilderness Reclamation that something has gone skew with somewhere. Anyway, Birchhead, without too much to say for themselves right now, after that Reclamation, maybe sitting on something like a Chemist's Insight. Let's see what they've got. Triple Opt means that their hand should be looking pretty good after all of those scries. So let's see what they've got on the boil here. Here's a Cavalier of Flame, cast after the... Uh, the fabled passage went to find uh, the fifth land. So let's see if Tay wants to improve his hand a little. But Birchett may have a response here. Oh. I see a lot of them. There's two mystical disputes and an A for Gust in this spot. So really, it's the pick of the litter. Okay, so mystical dispute is a bad mana leak for Birchett. Going to get rid of that threat. They don't have to face that down just yet here. And, and I love the interaction between the, the, the more controlling and traditional interaction of wilderness reclamation. Mm. Uh, with counter magic, being able to deploy a way to generate more mana, like on both turns, it's kind of like Fire's Invention, but on a but where you want to it, play think, on your opponent's turn. I was going to point out a, a little sort of uh, similarity between between both Fires and uh, Wilderness Wreck is the fact that you want to play it on turn four and then get immediate value from it by playing another card once you've uh, got access to that extra mana. We're going to see uh, Birchett, I think. Play a, is it going to be a Growth Spiral main phase here? It's two mana. What are we looking at? No, we, we kind of missed it because the video, a tiny skip of a beat. But at the end of turn, you float five mana. Then you get to untap your lands and decide to draw four cards. Oh, excuse cards. me. This is the end step. I missed I missed that. Uh, free cards, sorry. It's for okay. uh, access free. Yeah. Okay. So there we there we see an explosion with leaving three. Very, a, very, a highly suspicious three mana available. And I think Tay will be able to read that writing there. Birchett is sitting on another counter spell, and I think uh, Tay may have been able to sniff it out. But let's see what uh, the Singaporean's response is here. Mystical Dispute is really brutal against the Fire Stack. Go for it. Just gonna just Without gonna shove here. Yeah. I mean the 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 quality of the card changes so much when you're playing against. Uh, the Fires deck with Fires, Mystical Dispute does almost nothing. But when it doesn't have Fires, it is pretty much as close to a hard counter because yeah. it's really hard for the Fires deck to pay since all the cards are maximizing mm. your use of mana. I mean, it, uh, it's it's really Feast or Famine, isn't it? Because a lot of the time, a mana leak against a deck that never taps out is just... Ugh. And, and by the way, a good little trap by Autumn here. We have access to another Mystical Dispute in hand. All Autumn wants... Uh, take to do is recast that Cavalier. So going for Aphergust rather than Mystical Dispute mm. in order to uh, put Tay into a trap. Tay went for it as well. Put the Cavalier on top. It's going to get recast, going to get countered, and Autumn is going to get quite the advantage as a result. Yep, so Birchett firing on all cylinders. I saw a copy of Improbable Alliance there. There is a, a Temple of Mystery. Let's see if they're going to go for the Improbable Alliance. This is sort of a little sneaky win condition as well as a way to cycle through the deck. Love to see that. And there's the Growth Spiral, so immediately gaining value from this two-drop enchantment. Yeah, and that's why you saw Autumn uh, keep uh, a land at the top. You're probably wondering, wait, a se seven source of mana? But because it was a scry land, it makes sense. You develop your mana, you know you're getting that guaranteed value. And there's also an explosion in Autumn's hand, so... I mean, this might be over in quite short order because yep. Autumn gets to counter this. Yeah, I think and then so. We get I mean, to do an she's just, for tons. they've just laid so many traps, and Tay has walked into every single one here from Burchett. Counter spell after counter spell, Ether Gust into Mystical Dispute, now a Brazen Borrower as well. So. Birchett has just masterfully navigated this uh, this position here to put themselves in the best possible position because uh, Tay is just tapping out every time. Yeah, and this explosion, they are going to make an explosion for X up to X equals 10. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And I mean, I think this one is going to put game number one in the bag here for the English superstar. 
And that is going to do it for game number one. My friends, bad news. We do have to cut this game short, this match short, in fact, because we have got our next round upon us. And I can tell you that Autumn Burchett went on to win that game and indeed that match. So well done indeed to them. My friends, we are going to have to jump very quickly over to the desk. We're going to take a quick break, get things set up for our next round. So don't go anywhere. More live coverage of Mythic Championship 6 is coming your way in just a few moments. Thank <laughs> you.